We're gonna talk about roles and registers. Um, if you wanna know how to do that, uh, you're welcome to stay on. New clerks, I'd ask you to stay. Um, and we're going to start off by talking about something that I've said for the last four or five years, but that um, people don't seem to get until they realize it's a problem. Let me put up the slide. Hold on one second. Give me a minute. Screen share. Okay, can you see it? Preservation of records? Yes. Yes, it's up. Okay, thank you. So um, the first thing to know is that in our denomination, you can't just keep digital records. Yes, we are gonna exchange our minutes electronically, but you must have a hard copy of it. All right, it must be printed out as well. All right, the reason for that is the denomination says programs that you're typing things on change. And so they're sometimes harder to read down the road if you save it only in let's say um, Word and instead 20 or 30 years from now, there's some other form to read typing. Um, it won't work. The other thing is that it's also um, harder uh, to authenticate um, if it's just digital. So please also keep a hard copy. But having said that, all you need to do is to create for your hard copy is to put it on acid-free paper, all right? You do not need to put it on that, what used to be called those old Westminster binder paper, right? The big thick paper and clip it into a big heavy binder. That's not required, all right? You can put it in any, any good binder. I wouldn't use a flimsy vinyl binder, but any good binder and print it on acid-free paper and you're all set. What, why do I say not a flimsy vinyl, vinyl binder? Because they give up a gas that degrades records. And so that's not a great choice. And um, if you have a choice, inkjet printers are superior um, to laser printers for long-term record keeping. I didn't know that until a workshop last year, but I, the Presbyterian Historical Society told us that. An acid-free paper. These days, most paper is acid-free. Print it out, stick it in a three ring binder. That's fine. Pages do need to be numbered, but you don't need, need to use that heavy Westminster thing. That means you can run them off on a computer, on a printer, right? You don't have to try to use that, that paper in a special way in order to do that, all right? Um, the record should be signed by you and I will stamp them. Some of you have already sent in um, your, your last page to have them stamped. They should be numbered and any blank pages should have an X crossed through them, all right? To show that they are intentionally blank, all right? This is so something doesn't get added later. So if you have a half a page or a page that's blank, put an X through the page in order to make sure that everybody knows that it's, it's not there. There's, there wasn't meant to be something there, okay? So that's a starting point for any of your records that you have. Rolls, registers, minutes, any, any records you're keeping should be that way. Now, as far as rolls, this is, this is under the Book of Order. It's required under the Book of Order that rolls can only be changed by the session. That means any change you make in them have to be approved by the session, but the clerks are the ones who maintain them. The pastor doesn't maintain the rolls. The office manager doesn't maintain the roles. You maintain the roles as the clerk, right? Can the office manager do the changes for you? Yeah, they can, if you have an office manager who's willing to do that, but it's your responsibility as the clerk to make sure that everything the session is voted is recorded in your, in your roles, all right? And you're going to keep, as part of your roles, you're gonna keep three types of roles now under the, new form of government, which is no longer new, it's 10 years old, but under the new, what's still called the new form of government, it will be 2050 and it will still be the new form of government. 
Um, you only have to keep three kinds of roles now. Some roles have been deactivated, if you will. All right. So the first of them is a baptized member. These are people who have been baptized in your church, but not confirmed. All right. Not confirmed. So they haven't made a public profession of faith, but they have been baptized. You record their name, the date of the baptism, the church where their baptism occurred. All right. Once the person is confirmed, you remove them from the roles. How do you remove them from the roles? You don't white out a role ever, right? You don't put an X through the line. Over on the right side, you might write down removed and put in role of membership by confirmation and the date when you they were confirmed. Right? In other words, you're not blocking out when you're when you're doing changes in any of these three roles, you're not making them illegible. People need to see what was there before you change them. Instead, what you're doing is making changes on the side so that people know what those changes are. All right. So the first Susan, thing, Susan yeah. you have a question from Brenda. Okay, Brenda. I'm sorry, I totally don't understand this. This is like really, really new to me. Okay. Can you repeat what you just said? Sure. So you're talking about for the changes or you're talking about for baptized? Um, for the for the baptized. All right. Right. So if you have, for instance, a baby is the most common in our denomination. But if you have a person who is being baptized, you're going to put them on the role that you have. It's called baptized member. You're going to have three. You're going to have baptized members, active members, and affiliate members. They go on the baptized role. All right. Okay. You put their name down, the date that they were baptized. And your church, it's your church, obviously, if they're baptized somewhere else on behalf of your church, the pastor's doing it at their home or something, you might not note down that they were done at home, but on behalf of this church, all okay. right, on your role. They stay on your role until they become an active member. And you become an active member either by confirmation or as an adult, you could be baptized and become an active member almost right away. So they would... They could in one membership go from baptized roles on the same day, be moved off baptized roles onto active role if they're an adult journey. So I'll use, um, Pat mentioned that at Brook, we, there was a grandparent all the way through a, a young um, child who was baptized in a family. The older ones could have been baptized. And then if they joined the church that day, they would go on the adult baptism role and then move, be moved to the active role the same day. So that's the first part is the, the baptized members. The second category is active members, all right? These Susan, are- Susan, Astrid has her hand up. Hi, Astrid. Hi, Susan, uh, thanks for this detail. I, this is something that, um, uh, that I get an exception on <laughs> for a couple of years now. Do, when you're keeping these three roles of baptized active members and affiliate members, uh, what's the format? Are we keeping maybe an Excel spreadsheet with different tabs and then you hand that off to the successor you clerk could. that there's a lifetime role or you how does could. that You're work? Have, you also have to print it out because of our denominational requirements. It used to be, again, you had these big heavy brown Westminster binders that had papers that actually were made up with, already printed for you, baptized members at the top and then it had the columns and so forth. That's not required. So you, you can do it on an Excel spreadsheet. Each year you would print it out and add the, the new members that you put into the different categories if you're doing that. So there is a hard copy somewhere. Uh, is there a, um, a sample of this if I were to go onto the website uh, of what that looks like? Um, on our website, there's not. I could try to, if you email me, I will try to find one for you. Okay. Susan? So, mm -hmm. Christy asked to you repeat what you write for when someone is removed. So when they're removed from the role, you're going to put either, they could be removed in several different ways. They could be removed because they're being moved to another category. So a, let's say a child was baptized in the church, went through confirmation class and is now being confirmed. They would, you would put removed um, because, or moved to active membership right, and the date, 
by confirmation. Right. Or if they transfer, let's say they move to another church with their family and they haven't been confirmed, you would then put removed from our roles, move to the membership of XYZ church and where they are instead and the date. Okay, so the only people who stay who are on your baptized roles are people who have not yet joined the church officially. Right. That's usually where we see the mistake is people keep them on the baptized roles and on the active role. You can't be on more than one role in the, these two categories. You're either baptized or active. So that's baptized members. Active members are people who have made a profession of faith and commitment to their local church. Now this commitment can be made by we're going to get several categories under the Book of War. It can be made by profession of faith. I stand up and answer questions about what I believe in front of the congregation. It can be made by reaffirmation of faith. I was a member somewhere else, and I'm reaffirming my faith. But I was a, let's say I was a member in the Baptist church before, and I'm reaffirming, or a Catholic church. I'm reaffirming my faith now in the Presbyterian church as I join it. Or it can be by transfer of membership. I was a member in, I'm, I'll use the, the first two um, congregations I see on my screen. I was a member at the Yorktown Church, and now I'm going to the Gilead Church, right? I am now by transfer of membership from one Presbyterian Church to another, right? Those are the three ways you can become as an active member. No matter which way you join, the session has to vote to receive the person. Once the session has done that, you add them to the active member role. How do you do that? You record their name, the date they're received, the method of reception. So is it profession of faith? Is it reaffirmation of faith? Is it a transfer letter? And they're now on your membership roles. You can't deny, by the way, anybody membership for something other than lack of profession of faith. You can't say, I don't like your economics. I don't like your ethnic group. I don't like your social circumstances. I don't think you really, really are as good a Presbyterian as we are, right? You can't do that, All right? You can only, if they say, you, you ask them the questions for profession of faith and they say, I don't believe in any of those and I refuse to believe in any of those, then you can say, okay, we're not gonna put you on our rolls because this is what we require. But other than that, you can't deny someone a membership in, in, on the rolls, all right? Even if it's the biggest pain in the, the butt to <laughs> that, right? So said you, you have a question about the date they are received? They are received the day that they are voted on by the session. Okay. Christy, you're, Christy you're, you're muted. Yourself. Am I still there muted? There you go. Yeah, no, there you go. Right. So this didn't used to be an issue for us, but now with uh, uh, all the Zoom meetings, um, the date they are received by session is the date they are received into membership, even though they may be presented to the congregation and make their statements of faith at a different day. Am I making that clear? So we typically, in the old days, we would re the, the session would meet prior to a worship service, and right. we would accept them into membership. They would then be presented at the meet at at the at, at, at the yeah. during worship. Right. Um, now those could be two different dates. So what I'm hearing you say is that the so date that they are accepted into have, membership okay, is the so session. You would have the option of doing it one of two ways. You could have, if the session wants it to be the day that they're standing in front of the congregation, the session would vote to receive them into membership on X day, whatever that day. So we will receive them into membership on May 2nd. We will receive them into, okay. And that's what okay. the session is voting on. That's then the okay. day. And that's probably, if you're, if you're not doing the same day, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay. Um, is to actually have a vote when the session votes, put the date at which that's what we do in the presbytery. So when the, our committee on ministry, which acts in this case, the equivalent of our session, your session, receives a new minister, we vote to receive them as of a specific date. 
And that's the date that then I record for the denomination the way you, I do the same kind of record for the denomination okay. that you do for the, your session. All right. Thank you. Okay, Susan, in the chat, where are the paper records kept a separate binder or one binder with all three rolls? It's one binder with all rolls. You can often put in the register that we're going to talk about as well uh, in the same binder, but it should be a separate binder from your minute binder. Um, you have a question, Nancy has her hand up. Uh, yes, I did. And it's on new membership. Um, I just um, recorded two new members that were approved through session. Um, I noted that on my, on my roll, uh, the date was the day I put was the day that session had approved them. Our next process is their new member classes. And then we have chosen a Sunday where we publicly announce and do the, the like the ceremonial process of their new membership. And I would then present them with a thank you letter and a certificate. So at the question for what date you use would be, if you were to have a vote now in your congregation, would you be allowing them to vote? As an active, they have, well, in my understanding, or if I'm interpreting this, they are considered members because they were approved in on February 28th. If, if that's how you, you voted them as members, yes. day, the answer would be yes. That's the date. And they use. presented their statements of faith. They uh, agreed, they uh, presented the this letter. As, unless, you, unless you want to do something like Christy mentioned, where you want it to be a day that they're going to stand in front of the congregation, right. they yeah. become the day that you vote them as members is the date you use. All okay, right. yeah, that's what I also did. And may I just also just bring another question um, back to the uh, the registry. Um, again, I'm a new clerk to a very old church, which has the old binders that you were referring to. And you and may I, use them. You don't have to give them up if you want to use them, but they're just well, using a in printer. these binders, it looks as though you have to use them. They were using a typewriter. Well, I mean, nobody uses a typewriter any longer. And then the next clerk was actually handwriting, but they're awfully thick. Right. Um, I was actually going to look, and I've already spoken with this about, you know, with the pastor, look to um, order a new binder. But from what I'm understanding is that if I just get some acid free paper mm -hmm. and I now keep my roles, because I do have all my memberships on a an Excel spreadsheet because I'm better at that. If I categorize them and I put them on acid free paper, I can always just find them and put them in the drawer as is. That's fine. But you also want to keep make sure that not you don't want to be the only person who has access to those records. Right. right. So you want a hard copy that's printed out that's kept wherever your church keeps its official documents. So somewhere you may have a copy of your articles of incorporation and wherever your bylaws are. In yes, the best of do. all worlds, and we're not gonna spend much time on this today, but in the best of all worlds, every session member knows where that is because you somehow reference that in your manual of operations that you're giving each session member when they come on. Um, and so they, they would be able to, if there's a question, well, let's see, has so-and-so been a member for two months or five years? They would be able to go to where those records are and look it up in their in their manual, right? And then, okay. So so um, Susan, we were reminded in the chat that uh, you need to let the uh, church know that release them, so that they can remove them from their roles. So we're going to talk about transfer in one minute. That's what okay. So be before that, how do you remove somebody from an active role? You can remove them when they request it, all right, that's the first way. When the person dies, they're no longer an active member, obviously. When the person hasn't participated in worship or the mission of the church for two years, although as I say that, an, a diligent effort has to be made to let them know that, including written notification, all right, before removing them from the active role or when a person transfers to another congregation. And then you would put down next to their name, removed from membership by transfer, removed from membership or died and the date they died or whichever way they're, they're being removed next to their name. Why does that matter for you? 
because each year when you do your statistical report, one of the things you report is the number of members. Why is that important to your congregation? Among other things, because you pay per capita, right? You, for each member of your congregation, you pay a certain amount of money as for the interconnectional system. Some goes to the Presbytery, some to the Senate and to the General Assembly, all right? So you wanna be paying accurately. And that's, that's where you're gonna get the count is from these rolls and registers is of how many members you have. So you need to notice when, um, when they're being removed. Now, how you define what somebody who is not participating in your worship and mission means is up to your congregation. Some congregations have said, well, if they're sending in a dollar a year, even if they're not doing anything else, that's active and we're gonna keep them there. Some will say, um, it comes up a lot with students who go away to college after confirmation, right? We're gonna let them have the time that they're in college, even if we don't hear from them, and we'll be back in touch with them a year or two after they're done with college and say, do you still wanna be a member, All right? That's up to you. You don't have to remove someone after two years, but you can, all right? Uh, from whatever you consider to be inactive membership at that point. And again, you must notify them. If you don't know where they are, you must send a written notice to their last known address that you have. You have to make a good faith effort to say, we haven't seen you in six years. We're gonna take you off the rolls unless you wanna be on. And it's, if you wanna be on, here's what you have to do, okay? So now transfer to the question that came up. A transfer happens when a member has actually been received into the membership of the other church. That's the date at which the transfer has happened. So the receiving church accepts someone into membership pending the receipt of a certificate of transfer. All right. So I think, I'm trying to think who, Nancy, for instance, I think you wrote me about this recently, right? Asking who writes and who, who gets the letter and Yes, I did. I also had a transfer, which I received from the church receiving this member. They right. sent me a letter, and then I sent a letter back, of course, with session approval, and I sent back a letter saying, Dose so removed, right. uh, or so transferred, yes. So you, that's what will happen. Is you will get a request from the, the clerk of the, the congregation they want to transfer into saying, so-and-so says they're a member of your church. We want to receive them and we want to receive them on this date. Can you tell us that they're in good standing in your congregation and that, that will you transfer them? And you will send them a certificate of transfer. That can actually be a certificate if you have it. It can be a letter that you sign. But it says so-and-so is a member in good standing of the First Presbyterian Church and we are happy to welcome, recommend them to you for membership in your church, all right? Um, when you do that kind of transfer, you should, if there are young children that are part of that family, all right? So you have several children, let's say on the baptized roles, but they're not old enough to be a, a adult active member. You should note, it, note it that when you do the transfer and when they've been baptized, if they have, you know, um, Mildred Smith has two children, all right, and uh, so-and-so age four and so-and-so age seven, they are on our baptized member roles. They were each baptized in the dates they were baptized, right? So that they know that when they receive the children because when the child gets to a point of confirmation and wants to be confirmed, they're gonna wanna know where were they baptized. So send that along, all right? If the person you are transferring has been a ruling elder or a deacon, you need to send that along as well, because once you are ordained in the denomination, you are ordained forever. And so you are still a ruling elder. If you switch to another church, you're still a ruling elder. You may not be actively serving on the session at the moment, but you're still a ruling elder or you're still a deacon. And that new congregation needs to know that. So that's if you're transferring someone to another congregation. If you're wanting to receive someone from another congregation, it's your job. Again, not the pastors, not the session as a whole, not the office manager. It's your job to write a letter to the congregation they're coming from 
requesting that they be transferred and that you get a certificate of transfer. Susan, we have a question in the chat. If sure. if you're if you're inactive for more than two years, is there an official name for that? Uh, you mean for what happened? Where you go? You go into limbo. Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah. Uh, no, there's there's no official name. You're removed from the role. We're going to talk about other options of roles in a minute. But but no, there's no other other place you're officially going. You're just no longer an active member of the church. So those are the active members, and those are where you'll be doing the mo most of your record keeping. Probably is an active membership. The third category that exists is affiliate members. Right. An affiliate member is an active member of another church, all right, who wants to temporarily be a member of your church. Right? Who is temporary, let's say they're- Susan, yeah. none, none of your PowerPoints seem to be, uh, we only have the original. All right, let me try to take it down and put it back up again, hold on. Let me try one more time. So what, what was the last thing you saw? The active members with two categories or the member uh, roles with two categories. Try putting it back up and see if. Can you see the rest of it now? Yes. Okay, it must have frozen. So um, thanks, Deb. Um, so affiliate members, an affiliate member is somebody who wants to be for a short term a member of another congregation. It's a college student who's away at college and wants to join a Presbyterian church while they're away at college. It's a snowbird, right, who is going to Florida for six months of the year and then coming back for six months of the year and wants to be a member down there while they're there, um, who is temporarily away and wants to be affiliated with the church. And an affiliate member can only, you can be an affiliate member maximum for two years before it has to be renewed. And for those people, you, um, you put down their, again, their name, the date of affiliation, the home church where they are an active member. And then if they're going to be renewed, the renewal after two years, and also the date that they return to their original church, their church of active membership. This is not something that's common. In, in the churches that I've served in my last congregation, we had one woman who worked in Louisville for the denomination. And Evelyn wanted to keep her membership in the Dobbs Ferry congregation. But at the same time, she wanted to worship at a church in Louisville, right? So she had an affiliate membership down there and we would write a letter. So we got a letter saying, Evelyn is asking to be an affiliate member of this church in Louisville. Um, is that okay? And we put down in our roles that she was an affiliate member of that next to her active membership name, that she was an affiliate member from this year to this year while she was down there. But that's the only time in, in my record, my time working as a pastor where we've actually I've actually seen an affiliate membership. Right? It's not a common thing. You do need to know it's a role that you need to keep if that happens. So now there, the Book of Order provides for other categories that you can create. The question that I always get is inactive members. And it's sort of, I think, where in some ways the question, what do we do when we remove somebody goes? There used to be a requirement that you had to keep an inactive member role. It's no longer a requirement. Can you keep it? Yes, you can. Of course you can. If you keep that role, there are some advantages. Um, during COVID, for instance, one of the things that I've heard from one congregation after another is people who used to be members but moved away have come back and they're on screen now and they're worshiping with us and they've joined this adult ad and they're participating in our coffee, Zoom coffee hour. and. The, if you kept the inactive role, you could have moved them back from inactive. You have the record and move them back. You could do that, all right? On the other hand, you can just transfer them in from wherever they are or by professional faith again, if you want them back as membership. So your session needs to decide, are you keeping an inactive role? The Book of Order also allows you to create other categories now. 
So you could create a category for friends of the congregation. This may be somebody in your congregation whose family members are, for instance, active members, but because of their own religious beliefs, they're not comfortable joining the church. They may be Buddhist, or they may be Jewish, or they may be Muslim, or, but, but they want to somehow show their affiliation with your congregation. You're welcome under the new book of order to create another category for them, whatever you want to call it. And, and several churches have spent a lot of time, I know I had a discussion, he's, he's no longer a, a presbytery, but Ben Larson Wilbrink, who was the deacon pastor for a while, wanted to come up with a really snazzy name for what this category was going to be. You can do that and put people in it. You can do, uh, we've had conversations about, can you do this for people who come up with a category for people who are worshiping with you online, but haven't officially joined? Sure you can, come up with the category and welcome them to that category. Make it clear to them that they're not active members. In other words, they don't get the right to vote under the active membership category at this point, but they are well in into your church in this other way until they either be comfortable as an active member or as, an, as this other association, if they will not otherwise be comfortable. That's up to your session to decide for any of those categories you want. You don't have to have them, you can have them. It's a chance for us to be find ways to be more welcoming as congregations to people who may not be willing to completely pack up their bags and move in fully with us yet as congregations. Nancy, you have a question? Yes, again, um, in this new role, uh, we do have a directory of friends of the congregation. However, I don't have them on an inactive role, just as a phone directory that these are friends of the congregation. That's fine. Um, you could also put a role, if you wanted to have a record so that you could keep track of who they were, you could make a record that's an active friends of the congregation record that would go right into your roles and registers. Thank you. And you could, there are congregations that do that that then welcome these people the same way they welcome active members and so forth. Slightly different, you're not answering the same questions that you would ask an active member, but that they're welcome to the congregation. It's, it's, again, it's a way to make people feel much better into the congregation. And they may be actively participating. They may be serving on your property committee or serving on your, your um, finance committee or your, you know, that, that's all fine. As long as it's not your set, they can't serve on your session unless they're active members, but they can serve anywhere else. And, and not your deacons, but they can serve anywhere else. In the Susan, we have a question. Uh, if, if the roles have not been kept up, how far back do you have to go to straighten them out? 12th century. <laughs> Technically, that's the answer. Technically, you're obligated to go back and try to reconstruct the roles as far back as you can construct it from the beginning of your congregation. All right. Uh, I know that's not the answer whoever asked it wants to hear. Uh, There's also a question about how is per capita calculated? Um, per capita is calculated on the membership that you report, um, and there is a one-year lag. If you think about it, you report, for instance, you've just reported your 2020 membership, and that will be the per capita number that's used for your per capita in 2022, because you're reporting it in late 2020 or early 2021, so it can't be used for the 2021 figure, so there's a one-year lag. The amount is determined by the three um, judicatories above the congregation. The presbytery determines an amount for the presbytery part, the synod for the synod part, and the general assembly for the general assembly part. Each of those is, so for instance, you send a representative to the presbytery, the presbytery part is voted on each year as part of the approving the budget. And it, it can, and it, recommendations are, are brought in an explanation, but you, can, you vote that. The synod, the, the presbytery representatives that go to the synod voted. Same thing for general assembly. Commissioners we send to the general assembly vote the amount that goes to the general assembly. So there's representative government that votes those. There's a question about making up a statistical report for a missed year. Um, I wish there was a way to make up a statistical report. Um, I don't have any control over that. The denomination opens that in mid-December and closes it in mid-February. 
and you've got to file and it's got to be filed electronically now when i first started as state clerk you could set, send in a paper copy that's no longer the case you've got to put it down one of the things i will say to you is if you can't fill out every figure on the statistical report fill out what you can and that from the denominations perspective counts is filled out as long as you're putting down membership as long as you're putting down attendance as long i mean there are a few categories you will get even if you can't put them i wouldn't know how to do this in most congregations how many people in your congregation have hearing of hearing problems how many people in your congregation have other disabilities how many and i don't know if you know the age of everybody in your congregation some of the congregations actually have a database of birthdays but if you don't guess right put down what you can it's that those first pages on membership that the denomination cares the most about and will count as you're having filed it. So there's no way to make it up. Um, if, and that means that if you, it's, it's one of the reasons to file because if you don't file and your membership has changed, you're paying more per capita for the next year than you should be paying. This year we did very well. We had over two congregations file their statistical report. So most of you, it's not an issue. Um, but each year, it's a really important thing. It's one of the things, and whose responsibility is it? It's the clerk of sessions. It's not the pastors. Don't, I get a call and say, well, the pastor didn't file it from the clerk. I don't care. It's your responsibility. You're the clerk. It's your responsibility to file that. And while I would wave a magic wand and extend the time for you if I could, I got a question. Um, I'll pick, since he's no longer the clerk of session, I'll pick on Christie's predecessor. Whoever year would say to me, I know you can give me more time than what I put down. And I would say, Gordon, that's not the case. You, I've given you to the last day the denomination lets me give you. I can't give you more time. And so he'd say, all right, well, I'll file. But the dates I give you, I'm trying to give you the most time you could possibly file that report. So you can do it in December if you've got it together. You can do it through mid-February if you've got it. Beyond that, I, I had no control over it. He was still counting hearing aids. That always hung him up every year. Right. I, mean, I have a hearing loss and I don't have my hearing aids on today. How would you know, right? So I think Nancy has another question or is it the, did I forget to put your hand down, Nancy? Oh, okay. I have another question. I'm, I'm just completely loaded because I'm, I'm just like, I love being this clerk role. I, I know that's probably rare people say that but I'm just enjoying the learning opportunity here. Um, when, it, when it comes to that statistical report, um, again, being a new clerk, catching up on everything, I, I actually did a survey poll uh, with the members, um, which I just got all the results back, which I'm in question of some of them. Um, but I did get uh, several members that mentioned some of these things are private. I would rather not share that. Um, have you heard that mentioned before that asking people about their personal disabilities is I have and, and that's fine then you just you will notice for instance you may not notice because you want to see your own congregations mm -hmm. but I see all the congregations and one of the things is there are more members reported than often fill, are filling out certain categories and that's because people don't want to 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 share that information and that's fine uh, I know several congregations that keep a database and like you've just done write to people and say, we're creating this database. If you have these disabilities and would like us to know and put it in the database, put it down. If you have, you know, if you, what what racial ethnic division would you like to be listed under on the denomination? Put it down. What what age group um, would you be counted in? Put it down, and that's fine. But if they don't want to share those questions, then you put down, you can always answer from your roles and registers, are they a member? How many baptized members do you have? How many active members do you have? And what your Sunday attendance is? This year, that was a challenge. Do you count people who are on Zoom? Do you count everybody who goes on Zoom? Do you count people who come once? It's much harder. But usually, you can figure out how many people are in your sanctuary and, and what your average attendance is. Susan, Brenda's hand is up. Brenda? I'll raise my hand to get one. Oh, you're, you're muted. I can't hear you. If you're... And just a reminder, it's 3.50. Okay, Brenda, you're muted. Still muted. My, my question is, 
for the last, for all of last year, I've heard about these binders and I've heard about these stamps and you have to understand, I don't know what these binders look like. I don't know where and how these books get stamped. I am totally in the dark about that. So the book gets stamped by me. Um, you send the last page of your minutes that were just approved in, take a, a snapshot of it or a PDF of it or scan it, whatever works for you. You email it to me. I will stamp it and sign it and email it back to you. That's how the books get stamped now. When we're, and, and Stephanie is holding up, if you can see her screen, she is holding up a copy of the old fashioned binders that probably exist somewhere in the church. Um, that, and you see the tabs on them. That's one way to, to, to keep them. Um, so the, the books get stamped, I'm sorry. What, when minutes, you say the last page, is that like the December 2020? The December minutes, correct. The December 2020 minutes. The last page of that minute is what you would send me and I will stamp it. It used to be when we had clerk of session day, and we will do this when we can go back to face-to-face -face clerk of session day. I bring a stamp. You show me your, your approved minute reading exchange. I stamp your book there and you carry it home. There's no way to do that in this, in this setting at the moment. So I'm stamping them electronically. In that way. So you email me and I send them back. And please, I did about 20 of them the other day and I checked the wrong category on one of them. And the clerk got all upset. I think that, that they thought that I had found something in their minutes. If I've checked the wrong category, just tell me. It means I'm, I'm doing a lot of them and I just looked at the wrong form. And I can send more than one year because I took over at the end of 2019. The only year you need to have stamped is 2020. The last page that's stamped means everything is approved before that. I'm sorry, say again? The last page stamped means everything before that date was approved. So oh. if your 2020 minutes have been stamped, that means your 2019 were approved as well. Okay, excellent, thank you. Susan, um, Nancy's hand is up. Nancy. Oh yeah, I was. Um, you, I want to go back to that comment you made about twelfth century uh, corrections and looking at your your registers and rolls. Um, Brenda, I'm going to forward my my phone number to you um, so that if we can certainly commiserate together and talk. But um, if you do find um, discrepancies in your registries, how do you ratify them, or how do you? Make you're, going change, you're going to change them on the side again. When you put comments, like when I said you put remove or transferred active members, mm -hmm. you will put the change. You won't cross them out. You will note on the side. Later records show that the date was actually X, Y, and Z, or whatever the change would be. Okay. These are, these are important. We actually do get questions from people who are either doing genealogies or who want to get married and have to show that they're a member of a Christian denomination to get married in, a, let's say, the Catholic Church later, or um, and so the records are really important in a whole series of ways, and so it's if you find a discrepancy, it's important that you note it down. Yeah, and what if you find um, again? I'm going to expand on it: missing or one one more and one not added, or in in other words, this is what they said was the role, but you know, and I'm looking here and I don't see this person's name here. And you add you add it with the date. Again, even though it's out of chron chron uh, chronological order, you add it with the date that it would be added. Okay, thank you. S Susan, Sally's hand is up. Sally, please. Uh, uh, a quick question about uh, the congregational minutes. Now, at session meetings, you know, each month, of course, they get read and approved. And uh, but what about the congregational minutes? Do they need to be? Approved at a session meeting? It depends on your bylaws. Um, that's okay. why I said um, it's helpful to me to answer those kind of questions have your bylaws. So please send them in. Um, some bylaws provide that the next time the congregation meets, the first thing you do is approve the minutes from the former congregational meeting. Some bylaws provide that the session can approve the minutes of the congregational meeting. Some congregations have the clerk busily taking minutes while the meeting is happening and reading the motions to the congregation for approval afterwards and giving the clerk permission to fill in the rest of the details of the minutes afterwards. So it's actually voted as the last action of that meeting that the minutes, the, the minutes are approved. So you've got all three options depending on what your bylaws allow. Okay. 
Thank you. And also about having the book stamped for the session, I mean, the uh, clerk's report. Uh, can I, <laughs> I do have uh, problems with uh, technical computer skills. So can I physically mail that paper to you and you stamp it or no? You can mail me a copy of it. I don't want to be the holder of the only, I don't, the, the, you know, who knows what happens in the post office. So you yeah, can okay. copy and I'm happy to do it. And, and just mail it to, to the Presbyterian office and I will stamp it next time I'm there. Again. Thank you. Other questions on that? Okay, so what we've covered is roles. Um, let me just say again, do not erase, cross out, or white out. All right, use the remark sections. The same thing is true, you have a register behind it. And in the register, you have, and we're, we're, I know we have two minutes, and so I wanna make sure you understand this without going into great detail. You're gonna also keep lists of certain categories that are required. These are ruling elders. So when somebody becomes a ruling elder- Susan, Susan, are you sharing a PowerPoint? Do you want me to take that over? It's not showing. Okay. Hold I on. can share it. You want me to share it? Yes, if you could, that would be great. Okay. Let me stop my share. Okay, it should be up. It's not up yet. It, there we go. And it's the next screen I need that. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> If it doesn't move, it, then we've got a problem. I was well, you, along and you weren't seeing it. So yeah, you, you, you want the one that says registers? Registers, that's what I want. Okay, so you go ahead, I'll, I'll find that and put it up. So registers are also categories that you need to keep and they come right after the roles in your book. They are categories of baptisms. They will be a repeat of baptized members, but baptisms, ruling elders, deacons, installed pastors, and then you can choose to have a marriage register, all right? Before that, it was before the new form of government in 2011, it was required. Now it's an option. It's a good idea because you're going to get questions from people who have to show that they, they've been married for various reasons. If they're in some cases because they're getting a divorce, or in some cases because they want somebody to do a renewal of vows and they wanted proof that they were married in a church already, or I mean, I've, we've got a series of questions. So baptism, ruling elder, deacon, installed pastor, and marriage register, all right? And in each of those, again, you're gonna put when they happen, all right? When they happen, don't change them, but here's the information that you put down next to each of them. Ruling elder, were they ruling elder first at your church? Or if they've transferred in and they were ruling elder, put the church that told you they were ruling elder before that. And then each time they serve in your session, you put it down. If they resign from your session before their term is up, you put the end of their term, right? If they, we've had, I know one or two congregations contact me to say, we had ruling elders and they didn't like it and they quit and they don't wanna be counted as ever having been a ruling elder. Then you're gonna remove them, but you're not gonna take their name off the list. You're gonna put removed as ruling elder by choice, all right? It isn't that they did something that required them to be removed by choice. Deacons, the same thing, if you have a board of deacons. Installed pastors, the name of the pastor with the dates of service. Okay. This, and then if you're keeping a marriage register, the marriage register. So those are the two sections, your roles and your registers that you must keep up along with the minutes and what goes into them. And the next time that we meet face to face as a gathering of clerks of session, one of the things I will be asking for along with approval of minutes electronically is for you to bring your registers. The other clerks don't know this yet, but we haven't done it in several years now. I try every five years to have your registers approved, to bring them with you to have them approved at the next clerk of session day. So this year is your chance to get those roles and registers ready to go. So I think we're pretty close to four o'clock and I promise we'll try to end then. Any last questions or any last statements? Again, I, um, Mariah. What about um, deaths? 
in our register book, there's a section on deaths, but I don't know how, when the book was printed. You know, the official. There, there is a, a, there's usually a record. It's not required anymore by the book of order, but funerals and death and funeral are often a, a record. And again, that's for people doing genealogy, that's really helpful for family members who are trying to track somebody down and whether they've got it, it's a really helpful thing. So I would urge it, but it's not required at this point. In the old book of order, again, it was required. Libby? Um, I apologize if someone already asked this. Are you going to post these PowerPoints somewhere? Um, are we recording? Sure, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. I will go under, um, you know where it will be? It will be if you go to the website and you go to um, resources and then you click on session, that's okay. where I put most of the, the old training mod, uh, webinars I did for clerks are there. And I will add this PowerPoint there and the recording there. So you can- Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Nancy? Um, just to, again, one more thing. I'm a, a huge user of making my templates and everything. Does the Presbytery have a template that you could use if you were to uh, make your new role and your binders, or is it okay to just- you don't have one made up for congregations because it really depends on the categories for congregations. Some congregations don't have deacons. Okay. Some of them um, have those other categories of membership that we've talked right. about, et cetera. So we okay. don't. Um, and last but not least, I we've been Zooming and I have created an attendance list uh, in Excel where I keep it really gives me the averages. The first year I was actually charting, giving me a graphing chart of the attendance. Um, but um, that's also what I've been offering it if anybody needs to use something like that, uh, a spreadsheet on keeping an attendance. That would be wonderful to share. Anything else? And I thank you for your time. I know it's a Sunday, a weekend and people are off and want to get at doing other things. And at least here it stopped raining. No sun out, but it stopped raining. So I hope you get a little bit of a chance to be outside this afternoon. If you have questions, Deb and I are both here to answer them at any point, as are the rest of our staff. So feel free to, to contact us and just ask them. There's no question that you should have that you shouldn't feel free to ask, okay? So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.